Hey, good morning. Yeah, sure. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and uh, then I'll, I'll share with you what's on my heart. So, Lord, thank you so much for these great folks and uh, the high honor of being able to share with them this morning. And, uh, Lord, I pray as we come to you uh, and look at your word that you would um, do what you always do, and that is would you take over control of everything, <laughs> and you would just make us a bit more like you, how we love, how we uh, forgive, how we see ourselves, how we see the world. I pray that that would happen um, through the power of your spirit, and I pray, Father, that you would hide me in the cross so that would happen. I encourage all those listening to the sound of my voice to you, for you to make that your prayer. Lord, hide me in your cross right now and speak to me about what you would have in this incredible Sunday before a new year. In your name we ask, amen. amen. Welcome those in the chapel, uh, welcome those at Pleasant View and those at Pelzer, and of course you in the auditorium. Uh, I, I actually love speaking this particular Sunday of the year. It might be one of my favorite Sundays to speak, and I don't often speak on this Sunday of the year, usually because so much of the Christmas services are extra, and so I usually get a break on this particular Sunday. But the way Christmas fell this year in the middle of the week, I felt, well, I might as well go ahead. I'd like to go ahead and do it and finish this series out. And so the reason I like this particular time of year and this particular Sunday is I enjoy reflection this time of year. Like I reflect for like, like 48 hours in, in the course of a year. And so like I got like today and tomorrow that I enjoy this time of reflection. And I like to evaluate how I'm doing on a variety of things. And so I have these different areas of my life that I evaluate how I'm doing. And so I look back at the year and I look forward to what's coming in the new year. And in, in the series we're finishing up today, we've been doing some reflecting of our own. And uh, one of those things we've been reflecting on is this incredible, if you will, human hope we all have, and it's this, that, that change is actually possible for us. Because that's kind of what encourages us as we head into a new year, is the possibility that the new year could be different than, than the old year. Not necessarily the old year was horrible, it may have been a great year, but still, change is a possibility for the coming year. And, that, and that's the idea behind some of the personal reflection I go through this time of year. And so throughout the Grinchmas series, I've sort of given you or invited you into this process of, of reflection before we got to this Sunday. And we've been reflecting on these two questions. Uh, the first question we've been asking ourselves is, what kind of person do I want to be? And then the second question we've been asking ourselves is, what kind of life do I want to live? These are great questions to ask yourself, if you will, between two years. As you look back and as you look ahead, these are great things to reflect on. And the question that I've added to this on a personal level is, and how am I doing on either of these things? If you were to read the gospel story from Genesis to Revelation, you would make a, a, a startling discovery, and that's this. An encounter with God always prompts some kind of reaction. It's a series of questions or a period of reflection. In other words, nobody meets God and nobody meets Jesus and remains the same. And so no doubt Mary and Joseph had different lives because of Jesus and, and the disciples, they had different lives because of Jesus. The countless people who were healed had different lives because of Jesus. The people sitting on the side of the mountain who heard Jesus teach had different lives because of Jesus. And one of the best examples of people who encountered Jesus and changed or were changed actually comes directly out of the Christmas story. We've seen Mary and Joseph, they've arrived safely in Bethlehem and the baby's been born wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. We've seen that. And then, of course, a little bit later, we had the shepherds, and then we had the wise men come, and, and all those people encountered Jesus. Even King Herod heard about Jesus and was changed. But I want to go back to those shepherds, because it's those shepherds that hold my attention every, every year at this time, especially after Christmas. And it's been happening for me for, for decades now, probably two or, I don't know, but they've always held my attention. The, the shepherds are watching the sheep, and an angel of the Lord appears to them and says something like this. says, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah of the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. That's kind of how the whole thing begins. And if you remember, right before this, 
It says that the shepherds saw an angel and they were like terrified. That, that's a word that, that means, uh, it's actually two words that we use that make that one little word terrified. It's megaphobia. If you were raised on King James, it says sore afraid. Do you remember that? I remember thinking, wow, they were so scared. They were sore. What does that mean? And, and that's what it means. It's megaphobia. They were so terrified by this. You will find a baby. So immediately the angel, after this happens, is surrounded by this great cloud of angels, a whole mess of them, praising God and they're singing glory to God in the highest on earth peace. And, and you and I, we've heard this story. It's almost ordinary for us, but, but don't miss, it was not ordinary. If you'd never had this experience, it's because this was weird. This was a once in an all time event. And the announcement's one like they had never been offered before. In fact, even heaven rejoices at this announcement because the next verse says um, that the angel showed up. And then as soon as the angels got done celebrating, when the angels had left them, the shepherds, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, all right, let's go see this in Bethlehem and see this thing that's taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And this is awesome. This is a good time of year. We all have visions of children in their dad's bathrobes <laughs> and shepherd's crooks made out of cardboard cores of wrapping paper rolls, you know. All right, let's put up the tree and decorations and the next year Christmas is done. But hold on just a minute. What if there's something deeper that we have to find before we pack up all Christmas decorations. Because as people who are students of change, as part of the human race who hold hope for change even, let's see what happens after the shepherds see Jesus. Now pay very close attention when we read these things to the words that involve change in these next couple of verses. When the shepherds saw this, baby wrapped in cloth and clothes, line of manger, they made known what had been told them about this child. That's a change. Prior to that, they hadn't made anything known. And all who heard it were amazed. Now the change has produced, impacted people all around them. Amazed at what the shepherds told them, but Mary, she decides to treasure these words and ponders them in her heart. Again, that's a change. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God, that's a change. And all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. That is some significant change in the lives of our poor shepherds. These people were just great, good, common people. Most likely not highly educated, most, not, most likely not socially aware of a lot of things. Just watching sheep, it's what they did. Matthew says a little bit later, the wise men show up, and when they see this thing, he writes, they bowed down and worshiped Jesus. That's a change. But the word that always grabs my attention this time of year isn't all those amazing change words. It's not the glorifying, it's not the praising God, it's not telling other people about it. The word that always grabs me is, is that word. They returned. That's the one that I think we got to, that deserves some consideration. And I want you to hear this because this changes everything. There's some change in the lives of the shepherds and all that happens, but the shepherds meet Jesus, but then they returned and they were still shepherds. They went back to watching sheep. They went back to their same old robes and their same old sandals and their same old shepherd crooks and their same old shepherd pastures and the same old shepherd sheep and their same old shepherd spouses and their same old shepherd kids. And as far as we know, they remained shepherds for the rest of their lives. Hear me. They didn't get rich quick. They didn't all of a sudden find a check in the mail. They didn't have all their relational problems resolved. They didn't have health for the rest of their lives until they died in their sleep with their boots on. They weren't protected from the pain of losing someone they love. They didn't stop suffering with debilitating anxiety or overwhelming depression. 
they didn't stop having doubts or skepticism. They weren't spontaneously healed. They returned to their ordinary lives. Well, maybe we should sit up and take notice of that. And what we're expecting from this encounter we're having with Jesus. Maybe, maybe we too will meet Jesus and still will have our lives to return to. So, what is the change? What, what's the value of all of this? What difference does Jesus make in a life? Now, of course, they're the obvious ones, and I'll get these out so I don't get an email. I mean, there, there's salvation, forgiveness of sin. That's, that's a pretty big deal. That's a good thing, right? Amen? Amen? There's the process of being made like Jesus, being made holy. That also is important. That, that also happens. But there's even something more that lights me up during this special week after Christmas. And I think the reason it lights me up is because it's where I find myself these days. A relationship with Jesus is described in Scripture and in the writings of people we all respect in travel language, if you will, or journey language. A disciple is one who lives at the feet of Jesus growing and learning what it means to be like him. Another good word for that would be an apprentice or apprenticing under Jesus. It's one who sits at the feet of a master and takes everything in they can from that master in order to be like the master. Never arrive, but constantly changing and growing and learning and developing. We're moving somewhere. This is what it means to be a disciple. You've also maybe heard the word pilgrim used to, before to describe a person that has faith in Jesus or faith in anything. Maybe you've read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim refers to the direction of an apprentice of Jesus. We spend our lives going somewhere, going to God, and the path for getting there is this relationship with Jesus. We say things like this, this world is not my home or Maybe we say, you know, we're longing to be in our Father's house because we are people on a journey. We're pilgrims. Even Jesus said to Thomas, he said, I am the way. It's the exact same word for road. The truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through this road. But where are we going? And I'm not not talking about heaven. I figure that's out there for us, but where are we going? Like the shepherds, what if we meet Jesus and then we return to our normal lives? What's the point? <laughs> What's the change that's taking place that everybody talks about? Is this all about getting saved and punching our heaven ticket, and then living like everybody else lives in the world. Because if it is, why do we need the church? <laughs> Shoot, why do we need each other? And I'll go ahead and ask it in case you're thinking it. And Tom, why do we need you? These are all great questions that make me a little more uncomfortable than most of you in the room. Why, what's the point? Have you all ever heard of uh, Frederick Nietzsche? If you haven't ever heard of him, he invented uh, mustache wax, and so um, that's been an amazing uh, contribution to society. On top of that, he also was a German philosopher. Maybe you've heard the statements before, um, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. He, he's attributed to that, to that statement. He also said this, the essential thing in heaven and in earth is that there should be a long obedience in the same direction. There thereby results and has always resulted in the long run something that has made life worth living. 
Now, I know we're like post-Christmas kind of punchy right now, not to mention there was a significant game that took place last night. Amen. There was the closest day. There we got a reaction. Oh, now you're preaching, preacher. Y'all need to pray. So anyway, here, here, here. <laughs> let me say it again now that we got that out of the way and we just let the cat out of the bag. Whew. The essential thing in heaven and on earth is that there should be a long obedience in the same direction and there thereby results and has always resulted in the long run something that has made life worth living. See, I th this sounds like Christianity to me. Apprenticing at the feet of Jesus, pilgrims on a journey, followers of the way, long obedience in the same direction like the shepherds and the wise men and Mary and all the others who experienced Jesus, we also are called to live our lives after him. Not just for a moment in time, but a long obedience in the same direction, if you will. And if you stumble on the way, get up and continue the long obedience in the same direction, if you will. Surely that's part of what it means to follow Jesus. It's why when Jesus would most often talk about what it meant to have a relationship with him, he would use follow language. Jesus said this in John 8, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in dark darkness, but will have the light of life. Question, if you were going to spend the rest of your life walking in the long obedience in the same direction, doesn't the light of life seemed like a good journey to be on. And then John 10, Jesus said, my, she <clears throat> my sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Journey. Pilgrimage. But what does that mean? That following part. And let's just say there's maybe a couple of us that are saying, we want to make sure, we want to follow Jesus. If this is all there is, we want to do so with all the intensity of who we are. We want to, we want to do this well. What does it mean? What, what if following Jesus provides answers to the questions that we've been talking through this entire series, this Grinchmas series? The whole what kind of person do I want to be and what kind of life do I want to live? What if following Jesus answers those two questions? If we see Jesus and believe and then return to our lives, what does it mean to follow him? Am I connecting today? I mean, is this just about coming on Sunday and then returning to our lives as if Sunday didn't happen? Is that what the shepherds were involved in? Because it's not what I see that happened. It's not like they saw the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger and then went to watching sheep as if nothing had ever happened. What does it mean to follow? If we see Jesus and even believe, what happens during this long obedience in the same direction? This is Paul Turnier. He's a Swiss physician. He did some groundbreaking work in the area of pastoral care. He, um, he wrote a book called A Place for You, and as part of that, he described the human experience as, as being in between. It seems to me this is a good description of how we lead our lives. If you and I were to sit down and have coffee at your expense, and we really wanted to get to know each other, perhaps a good question to ask would be, what's your in-between like? 
Well, and I know that would kind of creep everybody out, but here's what I mean by that. Because we always seem to be in between something. Uh, maybe between the time we leave home and arrive at our destination. Maybe the time we leave adolescence and arrive at adulthood, which I'm assuming is somewhere in my future. Between the time we change the world and get our training to change the world. Between the time we fall in love and the time we decide to do life together forever. Between the time we're unemployed and the time we get a job. Between the time we get angry and the time we are reconciled. Between the time we have doubts and the time we arrive at faith. Between the time we work and the time we retire, the whole thing is in between. Between the time we're born and the time where we die. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's a pretty good description of a life, isn't it? We live in between. The in between is sort of like when a trapeze artist releases the bar and they're suspended in midair and waiting on the next bar, that's, that's the in-between. It's a good metaphor for life. I think the shepherds and the wise men and Mary and Joseph and the alive community, Christians, I think we understand with full awareness the in-between. Because it's the already of Christmas and the not yet of being with Jesus forever. We're in between. It's, it's the already, if you will, in theological language of the first coming and the not yet of his second coming. And, and this in between time, scripture offers this beautiful word to guide us as we're in between, as we're swinging from one trapeze bar to another, if you will, as we're in these periods of transition in all of our lives, this in-between, the Scripture offers this word that's been feeding me, directing me on my pilgrimage, if you will. As we return to shepherding, or counting, or building, or raising a family, or doctoring, or teaching, or retiring, as we return to our in-between, the Bible says over and over and over again, repent. I, I, I used to think repent meant that I would cry and be sorry for my sin. And that's a good thing. But it's really not what the word means. I think repent means a whole lot more than that. Repentance, if you will, isn't an emotion. It'll elicit an emotion sometimes. But repentance is actually a decision. And Jesus commanded us over and over again, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And this is a decision. It's it's deciding <clears throat> that you have been wrong in supposing that you could manage your own life and be your own God. It's deciding that you were wrong in thinking that you had or could get the strength, the education, and training to actually make it through this life on your own. It's, it's deciding that you've been told a whole pack of lies about yourself and your neighbors and your world and what makes everybody happy. It's deciding that God in Jesus Christ is telling you the truth. Repentance is this decision, if you will, to follow Jesus Christ and to become his pilgrim in the path of peace. That's what we define repentance around here as this. To repent is to rethink how we think about everything. You want to mess your life up this year? 
this is a good place to start. Rethink how you think about everything. See, I'm coming to believe and to see that I've been fed a great many lies by this world. St st stay with me if, if, if you're with me this far. Stay with me and see if I can get somewhere. And there are lies that I've built a life on. And I've seen you also have built a life on these lies. Which shouldn't surprise me because Satan's called the father of lies. And here we are, people that are pilgrims on the journey, who've seen the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, but we've returned to the lies. And these lies are so deeply intertwined with who I am and respectfully who you are that the lies now seem as normal and, and true. But we've been told a lie since the beginning. Uh, the, we've been told a lie and, and so much so that you're going to kind of resist what I'm getting ready to say. We've been told a lie that human beings are basically good and nice, and we're not. Even in the South, we're not. Prove it to me. Okay, Facebook. Let's stand for closing prayer. <laughs> we're not basically good and nice. We're basically selfish and do what's good for me. I'll give you some examples, and then I'll pull us out of this dark hole. Um, ad advertisers claim to know what we need, and they're getting really good at it, like they're spying on us through Alexa and other stuff, you know. And they claim to know what we need, and we buy into that lie that more of that will make us better. Anybody else buy into that lie? I have. How about this one? Have you ever noticed we give microphones to entertainers? <laughs> Tom had a bad Christmas. <laughs> what do they promise us? People dressed up in fancy makeup and fancy clothes. They promise there's a cheap way to joy, and we buy into that. Fame and fortune will be better than what we have here. And it's a lie. Politicians, need I go on? Okay, I will. Politicians instruct us and govern us with power, get this, but the absence of morality, and we buy it. We're all buying it. It's all okay. It's all normal. Guess what? It's a stinking lie. Morality matters, whoever, whatever flavor you vote. It matters. And we buy into the lie that power is the great carrot on the stick, not morality and not integrity. And so we'll vote that way. We'll vote on agendas. Psychologists offer to shape our behavior so we will live long, happy, and successful lives, and yet we're still anxious about everything. We bought into a lie. And we pastors, we get rid of God's commandments, offer suggestions, <laughs> so we won't be inconvenienced and can still believe we're in charge. And maybe you could make a list of lies. Those are just ones that crashed my brain on Friday morning. These are all lies because they claim to tell us who we are. Listen, this is, I haven't done a great job of building to the final moment, but I'm getting to this final moment. They claim to tell us who we are, and yet, listen, omit everything about our origin in God and our destiny in God. That means the whole thing's a pack of lies, and we've bought it. 
The lies talk about the world without telling us that God made it. So everything that flows out of that becomes suspect at best. And so my conclusion is this journey of in-between that we're on is one of rethinking how we think about everything. It's one of repentance. Rethink how you think about everything. God, teach me to see as you see and do as you do and live as you live. That's the journey. That's the pilgrimage we're all on. Eugene Peterson writes this. A person has to get fed up with the ways of the world before he or she acquires an appetite for the world of grace. What are you hungry for? Because there's two deals on the table and you're gonna stuff one of them in your pie hole just like I am. What are you hungry for? What are you feeding your family? What are you feeding your inner thoughts? Shepherds return to the fields, to the sheep, and to their ordinary lives, just like we will do here in a few moments. None of their ordinary lives have changed. But they had. Their eyes had been opened. They now saw clearly. They had a new hunger and a new appetite that had been awakened for the things of God that they didn't have before, just like it's available to me and available to you. They were extraordinary because now their life had meaning and purpose based on truth, not a lie. And they began this process that is part of the journey we're all on as we fly from one trapeze to the other of lies melting away and truth rushing in. So let me just leave you with some truth. The truth about me is that God loves me and made me. That's truth. The truth about you is that God loves you and made you, but we're all screw-ups, Tom. It doesn't seem to matter. The truth about God is he still loves us. The truth about the one you're sitting beside is that God made them and loves them as well. The truth about the one you'll encounter as you go to lunch is that God made them and loves them as well. He doesn't love you more than them or vice versa. The truth about the world is that God created it, he rules it, and he provides for it. The truth about what is wrong with the world is that I and the neighbor beside me have sinned in refusing to let God be for us, in us, and over us. That's the truth about what's going on in society. We, not them, we have all sinned. We bought into a lie. The truth about what is at the center of our lives 
is that a baby was born in a manger. And that wooden manger leads to a wooden cross. And Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for our sin, and he was raised from the tomb for our salvation. And as a result, we can participate in a brand spanking new life as we believe in him. That's truth. Anything that tells you different is a lie. And the truth about this in-between that we're all in, we find ourselves in today, the truth about this in-between is as we repent, as we rethink how we think about everything, we see clearly beyond the lies. What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of life do you want to live? I am deeply motivated, as many of you are, to being a person and living a life based on truth, not lies. So Lord, uh, thank you for this Sunday. It's this beautiful moment when all the rush of the Christmas season is behind us. We're all in our starting blocks to begin the race of a new year. I wonder what you have in store for us this year. I wonder what opportunities and blessings are going to flow. I wonder what challenges and trials we'll encounter. Lord, if there is any ability for a group of people to lift a prayer corporately and ask for a blessing on a community, and I believe there is. We pray for truth this year. We pray that lies would be rooted out of who we are, not just the external, but the internal. And we would be people of truth. We would live lives of truth. Be our guide in all of that, we ask in your name. Amen.